very good morning to all of you good morning sir good morning good morning sir good morning good morning good morning good morning good morning sir okay so i think someone is absent today i will have to check that who is it okay fine so as we discussed yesterday today we will be stepping into the most important parts of the unit wherein we start discussing metabolic pathways wherein we start understanding what happens in each and every reaction that constitute uh, the metabolic pathway so i've shown you the list yesterday we will be beginning with emp glycolysis uh so without wasting much time let us dive into it by now you already know the nature of metabolic pathways you know that whenever we speak about metabolic pathways we have uh these three terms that we make use of very commonly we make use of terms like catabolic anabolic and amphibolic right so you very well know that catabolic processes are those processes wherein we are speaking about breaking down complex materials to simple ones and in this process there is release of energy while in case of anabolic processes we are speaking about making complex materials from the simple ones right and in this obviously there's going to be an investment of energy that's needed while in case of amphibolic pathway it is going to be both these are those pathways which are both catabolic and anabolic right that's why we refer to them as amphibolic pathways while you study all these metabolic pathways which are listed in your curriculum you will see that there are so many pathways which come under the category of amphibolic pathways wherein they might be majorly a catabolic process wherein you may be breaking down something but the intermediates of this catabolic process are involved in anabolism and that's how any metabolic pathway becomes a web of reaction so when you go to keg and when you type human metabolism you see a huge map wherein you will see that everything seems to be linked because intermediates of one pathway automatically becomes the reactant for the other and that's how all metabolic pathways are interconnected and anything that goes wrong with one pathway could have direct or indirect effect on the other pathway right so remember that it's just like a spider web like network now this is something that we should know when we talk about catabolism of or rather metabolism of carbohydrates we very well know that when we talk about the food chain the most important organisms are the photosynthetic organisms the autotrophs because they are fixing energy and that is the energy which enters the food chain and that's how all the other organisms are directly or indirectly dependent on these photoautotrophs right if it were if it was not about them if they were not present on earth then it would have been very difficult for the organisms to sustain because the continuous supply of food that we get is because of these organisms the so photosynthetic autotrophs which fix sunlight and they produce their own food that food is actually sustaining the entire food chain or the food web so we as heterotrophs are directly or indirectly dependent on them so we need to understand that our role on in the food chain is also equally significant why is it equally significant because whatever food you are consuming you are breaking it down to simple materials which can again be used by these autotrophs to prepare their own food so the way the photosynthetic autotrophs are very important we also have a significant role to play wherein we are metabolizing the food stuff which is produced by these photosynthetic autotrophs and reaches us in the food chain we are metabolizing it to the level of simple products like carbon dioxide and water which are the raw materials for the photosynthetic organisms to synthesize glucose so please understand that both the ends of this particular food chain are going to be equally significant you cannot give complete credit to either of these both the ends have to be balanced now when you talk about catabolism and anabolism have a look at this flow chart have a look at the right hand side first 
So on the right hand side of this flow chart, it shows you the catabolism process, wherein you can see that certain energy containing nutrients like carbohydrates, fats, proteins, they are being broken down. Okay. And for this breakdown process, obviously you uh, will require certain cofactors and coenzymes. Okay, and you will also see that a lot of energy is released. So you can see that NAD, NADP, FAD, these are all getting reduced. Okay, these are all getting reduced to form NADH, NADPH, FADH2. So I hope that you all know what NAD, NADP, and FAD are. These all are categorized as coenzymes. When you talk about NAD, let me tell you that NAD is nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide that's the full form of nad if you add a phosphate here it becomes nadp okay while for fad it's flavin adenine dinucleotide so all these uh, compounds that you see over here, NAD+, plus, NADP+, plus, FAD, all these will accept hydrogen while oxidation is taking place of substrate. And those hydrogens which are removed from the substrate will be taken up by these molecules. And that's how you get NAD, NADPH, FADH. These are all energy-rich components. The reduced, uh, you know, coenzymes are all energy-rich components. And they are what are channelized to what you call as electron transport chain, where you are going to derive energy from them. Because if you remember in 12th standard, you would have studied ETC, and then you would have seen how NADH molecule is converted into NAD, FADH2 molecule is converted into FAD, and in that process of ETC, you generate ATP molecule. Right? So catabolism is a process wherein you are going to generate a lot of energy when you are breaking down the energy containing nutrients to some energy depleted end products because the end products which are produced in the process of catabolism they are going to be devoid of energy like co2 h2o nh3 these are not going to have energy in them now if you talk about anabolism it's the process wherein you are making the macromolecules of the cell from precursor molecules so making proteins from amino acids polysaccharides from uh, sugars, lipids from fatty acids, uh, nucleic acids from nitrogenous bases. These are some of the best examples for anabolic reaction. Now you have to understand that for such processes, which are building processes, constructive processes, you have to you know, invest energy, okay? And you will also see that a lot of reductive reactions take place in anabolism, wherein hydrogen is added to the substrate. Okay, so NADH, NADPH, FADH2, these can all act as hydrogen donors and they can go back to their oxidized state. What is that oxidized state? NAD, NADP, FAD. So exactly reverse of, you know, what happens in catabolism is happening in anabolism. In catabolism, you were seeing that these coenzymes were accepting hydrogens and getting reduced. But now in anabolism, you can see that these same reduced coenzymes now can donate hydrogen and go back to their oxidized form. And similarly, ATP will be converted to ADP because you are going to spend energy. Remember that anabolism is an energy expensive process. It's going to be an expenditure of energy. Now, there are two types of, or rather three types of, uh, you know, catabolism that we have to consider. First being converging catabolism. Now, as you can see in the image, I think it, it is very clear of what it tries to depict, right? You talk about starch, glycogen, sucrose, glucose, or amino acids, or fatty acids. You will see that all of these components ultimately are going to be catabolized to the same molecule, which is acetate or acetyl-CoA. So what does this mean? That whatever may be your substrate, you are going to be catabolizing it to that same component, okay, which is acetyl-CoA. So because all these substrates are different, but they are converging at a point to produce that same molecule, we call it as 
converging catabolism. But the way you have converging catabolism, you also have diverging anabolism, wherein you will see that, uh, you know, different intermediates are involving themselves in different anabolic processes, in different constructive processes, right? So you will not see any convergence there. You can see that within fatty acids itself, uh, you can see three divergences taking place. One to make eicosanoids, another to make triacylglycerol, yet another to make phospholipids, right? So please understand that the intermediates of the same process may be involved in completely unrelated and different anabolic reaction. It's not necessary that the Krebs cycle of all the intermediates will be part of the same anabolic process. It's not necessary. The Krebs cycle of all the intermediates can be part of the same anabolic process. And one intermediate can be part of the same intermediate can be part of the same anabolic process. Now you understand why it becomes a complicated metabolic web, right? Because a single intermediate may participate as a precursor, as a raw material in more than one anabolic process. And other than that, you also have cyclic pathways. So in biochemistry, you will be seeing a lot of cycles where in the beginning and the end point is the same, like prep cycle. So such pathways will be referred to as cyclic pathways. So you will see converging metabolism. You will see diverging uh, metabolism. And you will see some cyclic processes as well, right? Okay, so this was some basic introductory part to metabolic pathways before we actually jump into the fate of glucose. So when you talk about glycogen, starch, cellulose, all these are polymers of glucose, right? So we, we just discussed in our last few lectures that when I'm breaking these polysaccharides down, I'm going to break them down to their monomers. I'm going to break them down to the level of glucose. What after that? What happens to the glucose after it is being produced from polysaccharides, after it is being released as free glucose molecules from the polysaccharides? So please understand that there are different things that can happen to glucose in the cell after it is being taken up in the cell. First and foremost is that some of this glucose will get into glycolysis. It will undergo oxidation. It will be converted to pyruvic acid, which is a product of glycolysis. And thereafter, you know that the process will continue, right? So it can get into glycolysis and it can produce pyruvic acid. Some amount of glucose will get into pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, it can get into pentose phosphate pathway if the organism has enzymes for the same. And this is nothing but the HMP pathway, the hexose monophosphate pathway. It's also called as the pentose phosphate pathway. You will know why when we discuss HMP. So here glucose is converted into ribose 5 phosphate. Now you will say that why is ribose 5 phosphate being produced? What is its significance? So do not forget that your nucleotides, uh, they uh, basically need ribose and deoxyribose, right? So uh, you need to have ribose 5-phosphate with you to do that. So that's the reason why uh, many a times organisms may carry out HMP pathway to generate the ribose, which could be then utilized for synthesizing the nucleotide. Or even after this, after carrying out glycolysis and even after carrying out HMP, if there is still good amount of glucose that's left within the cell, then in those circumstances, that's going to be part of reserve food materials. So it's going to go into the storehouse of the cell and it's going to be stored in different forms. So depending on the organism, if it's a plant, then it prefers to store it as starch and if it's an animal or some kind of a microbe, you will see glycogen, some may also store it as fructose. So you have to understand that uh, all of the glucose is not going to be utilized. The cell always has a strategy in place. It knows that today there is availability of food, but it doesn't guarantee the availability of food later. So why not sparingly use the resources available? And uh, whenever there is going to be a shortage of uh, food, then you make use of the reserve food material that you have been storing since a long period of time. That's how you will see uh, the cells being effective in you know, uh, utilizing glucose. They have a good strategy in place. 
they're not like us. Our cells are much smarter than what we are, is what I always say. Okay, we are greedy. Okay, but the cells are, even though they might be greedy, but they know how to control themselves and how to have a good storehouse within them so that whenever food is not available, they have something at hand to utilize. So now we move to understanding what glycolysis is all about. Okay. So glycolysis, if you look at this word and split it, you get glycose and lysis. Glycose, this word comes from glycis, which stands for sweet, and lysis, which stands for splitting. So this particular process deals with splitting the glucose molecules, which is a six carbon compound to produce two molecules of pyruvic acid. So pyruvic acid, as you know, is a three carbon compound. So you are splitting a six carbon compound to produce two molecules of a C carbon compound. So that's the reason why glycolysis, which means that at some point you are going to split this six carbon compound to give you two uh, three carbon compounds. Right? So that, that is the reason why it has got the term as glycolysis. Many people also refer to it as glycolytic cleavage. Okay. Now the main source of carbs on this earth is starch. In case of plants, starch and cellulose are those polymers which are extremely rich in glucose. But yes, uh, breaking down cellulose is a very big task. You have already seen that it is encrusted with lignin. And most of the, uh, you know, cellulose is present in the structural part of plants. So uh, it's not going to be something which is going to be broken down and metabolized by plants because it's a structural composition of uh, the cell wall. So the plants are going to ultimately depend on starch that they have stored as a source of energy. In very extreme cases, when there is severe shortage, then they might, uh, you know, look after cellulose. But that's going to be very rare. In case of animal tissues, you know that we have glycogen, right? Two thirds of this glycogen is present in skeletal muscles because that's where a lot of ATP is going to be needed, right? So a lot of glycogen is going to be stored in the skeletal muscles. Now, please understand that whether an organism is aerobic or it is anaerobic, glycolysis is going to be the common step in both the process. Okay, so glycolysis is a pathway which is common to both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. So you can in a way say that this process is independent of oxygen. Okay, oxygen ho, nahi ho, this process is still going to take place. Okay, so in both the processes, you will see glycolysis being the first step uh, of respiration. Now, we refer to glycolysis as an incomplete breakdown. Why do we call it as an incomplete breakdown? I will refer to something as a complete breakdown if I'm going to break it down to the level of carbon dioxide and water. Okay, but glycolysis, I've already told you in the very beginning itself, it deals with the breakdown of a six carbon compound to give you two molecules of a three carbon compound. So I am going to refer to this as an incomplete breakdown, wherein I am not really completely metabolizing the compound to the level of carbon dioxide. As said earlier, it's independent of oxygen. Okay, comparatively less amount of energy is released in the process as compared to what happens in the other stages of aerobic respiration like Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, which is ETC. You will see that relatively less amount of energy is going to be released in glycolysis, but uh, it's still a significant amount. You cannot, uh, you know, belittle it because it is still a significant amount of energy that is going to be generated in glycolysis. Comparatively, yes, it's going to be less, but that doesn't make it insignificant, right? So uh, we need to understand this, that uh, you cannot belittle the amount of energy that's going to be released in this uh, process, okay? Now, the process obviously, as I said, is an incomplete breakdown, right? It's, it's not a complete breakdown, which means that it's an uh, incomplete combustion of glucose that's taking place over here, right? So this incomplete combustion also has its own set of advantages. 
because you are going to be generating a lot of intermediates in the process and these intermediates can uh, you know further be utilized for some constructive processes okay so that is one of the significant advantages of uh, not doing the complete breakdown because from pyruvate also a lot of anabolic processes can happen pyruvate could be even converted to acetyl coa uh, by a single step uh or not a single step rather but uh, but a set of reactions that take place there to convert it to acetyl coa which can be further used for anabolism as well okay so uh that is one of the advantage of not doing the complete breakdown okay and this is also the you know uh, diverting point for aerobic and anaerobic respiration that is after reaching up to pyruvate uh, the fate is going to change depending on whether the organism carries out aerobic respiration or it carries out anaerobic respiration. Because if it is going to carry out aerobic respiration, it will get into Krebs cycle. It will start preparing itself for Krebs cycle. But if it is anaerobic respiration, then depending on whether it is alcohol uh, fermentation or lactic acid fermentation, the steps are going to vary. So pyruvate is going to be that divergence point wherein on the basis of the kind of respiration that the organism carries out you will be able to see divergence in the process okay now these are those three scientists uh, who are credited there is hans wons euler chelpin there is gustav emden there is otto meyerhoff and there is also parnas okay so emden meyerhoff and parnas they have made significant discoveries in the process because of which uh, you know the credit is given to these three that is emden meyerhoff and parnas and that's why we call it as emp pathway emden meyerhoff and parnas pathway giving credit to the uh, significant contribution that they have given to uh, deduce this pathway down we call it as emp pathway now please understand that it's not that it's just these three scientists who you know, have worked hard to deduce this pathway. This pathway has had involvement of several scientists uh, and it, it begins, you know, early in the uh, 18th century when the work started to deduce this pathway down. And uh, it's very interesting to see how, you know, different experiments have led to the discovery of this particular pathway, which today we refer to as the EMP pathway. So, the first, you know, uh, uh, metabolic pathway to have been elucidated and best understood is the glycolysis pathway. Okay, so it was Edward Buckner whose discovery in 1897 of fermentation in broken extract of yeast cells, uh, you know, gave rise to this study of glycolysis because he said that. Yeast cell ko agar tum break karoge, to uske extracts are still able to carry out fermentation. So, uh, ye jo study hai, uh, ye ek tarikhe se glycolysis ke pure elucidation ke liye responsible hai. Okay? So, different scientists got themselves involved wherein Emden and Meyerhoff were studying this process in the muscle cells. Okay? While uh, we also have people like uh, Chelpin and Warburg who were studying it in the yeast. So, simultaneous studies were happening right and ultimately the major contribution came from emden Meyerhoff, and parnas but there were people like harden and young robinson newberg corey uh warburg all these people have made significant contributions to the process like harden and young they were responsible to find out that uh sugars like glucose or fructose are not present as glucose and fructose but as phosphorylated derivatives of sugars Okay, and this gave rise to a question in people's mind that why is so many phosphorylated intermediates present in glycolysis? Because if you see glycolysis, har step mein tumko phosphate group dikh raha. So phosphorylated derivatives rakhne ki kya zarurat hai? Ye ek bahut bada question tha. Aur experiment se ye pata chala ki uske piche teen bahut hi significant reasons hai ki why are uh, you know intermediates phosphorylated in glycolysis? The first and foremost is that sugars ko cell ke bahar escape hone se rokna hai. You want to stop the sugars from escaping out of the cell. So, uh, you know, phosphorylating was the best method because the transporters present in the cell membrane, they do not have the ability to transport the phosphorylated forms of sugar out of the cell. 
ओके तो एक बार अगर तुमने शुगर को फॉस्फोराइलेट कर दिया तो वो सेल से बाहर एस्केप नहीं हो सकता ये सबसे बड़ा रीजन था फॉस्फोराइलेटेड इंटरमीडिएट होने का सेकेंड थिंग वॉज ऑब्वियसली वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग सिंस द वेरी बिगिनिंग तक जब भी आप कैटाबोलिज्म कैरी आउट कर रहे हो और अगर आप फॉस्फेट एस्टर्स बना रहे हो तो जो भी एनर्जी ऑब्वियसली रिलीज हो रहा है दैट इज बीइंग कंजर्व राइट और जब भी आप इन फॉस्फेट ग्रुप्स को तोड़ोगे तो उसमें जो भी एनर्जी आपने स्टोर किया है वो एनर्जी रिलीज होगा और उसको आप एटीपी के फॉर्म में कंजर्व कर सकते हो सो दीज फॉस्फेट बॉन्ड्स आर हैविंग एनर्जी इन दम इन शॉर्ट एंड दैट एनर्जी कुड बी यूटिलाइज टू फॉर्म एटीपी मोलिक्यूल सो टू सिंथिसाइज एनर्जी phosphorylated intermediates are the best because these uh, intermediates which are phosphorylated they will not just uh, you know release out energy but also donate the phosphate group to convert adp to atp so energy synthesis is the second reason so we have discussed two reasons the first reason is that we don't want the intermediate to escape out of the cell because the cell membrane transporters they cannot transport the phosphorylated forms of sugars out of the cell the second reason that we gave was that uh, these phosphorylated groups they have a lot of energy in them so when you break those bonds there's going to be a lot of energy release so the phosphate group and the energy could be utilized to convert adp to atp and finally it is said that the phosphate groups of you know of these intermediates they are also responsible for reducing the activation energy of the enzyme so you know the reactions happen with much more ease because the phosphate group present in the substrate they lower the activation energy and also increases the specificity of the uh, enzymatic reactions that are taking place in glycolysis so the third reason is lowering the activation energy and increasing the specificity so these are the three reasons that you know are there uh, because of which maximum of the intermediates of glycolysis are going to be phosphorylated so uh, i hope you guys are with me and you have understood things till this point yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. so when you read this section please see to it that you have to refer to books okay you have to refer leninger uh, where in the the part where glycolysis begins you have all these points in detail and uh, also the three reasons for phosphorylation you will find it in leninger okay and all those pictures that we saw uh, in today's session are also from leninger itself but the reactions uh, that we are going to discuss in glycolysis they are from both leninger as well as conen stump okay so some part of it where i felt that conen stump is not elaborating it in much detail Uh, I have picked up points from Leninger. So what I have done is for Conning stump, I have already uh, scanned the entire part of glycolysis, and that is uploaded in the Google Drive that was given to you for e-books, which is on Classroom. Okay, so in that you will see that the file itself is named as Conning stump glycolysis. So which means that that particular PDF has the scanned pages which you have to read for glycolysis and Leninger any which ways you have e-book, right? so you can refer both the books for the part of glycolysis okay so let us move ahead now now glycolysis is split into two phases we have a preparative phase and we have an oxidative or payoff phase now when uh, these two phases are there i always tell students that i describe these two phases like pehle tum bakri ko khila pila ke khush kar rahe ho that's the preparative phase and then tum usko kaat rahe ho that's the payoff phase or the oxidative phase so you are preparing glucose molecule for its cleavage for its lysis so that preparation of glucose is what we call as the preparative phase wherein you are trying to modify glucose in such a way that its cleavage is going to be easier and is going to release good amount of energy okay so that's why you are preparing glucose molecule that's why we refer to it as preparative phase and the actual phase wherein you get energy out of the process is the payoff phase or the oxidative phase because you know in doing preparation you invest some energy okay tum energy wahan pe invest karne wale ho preparation ke dauran kyunki tumko glucose ko modify karna hai okay lekin jab aap actual oxidation karte ho tab aap energy gain karte ho 
तो जो भी एनर्जी आपने इन्वेस्ट किया है वो आपको जरूर यू नो यू विल बी एबल टू पे इट ऑफ एंड अदर देन दैट आल्सो यू विल गेट सम एक्स्ट्रा अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी तो जो लोन लिया है वो लोन चुकाने भी मिलेगा और साथ में कुछ एक्स्ट्रा गेन भी होगा सो दैट्स द पे ऑफ से बिकॉज यू हैव टेकन सम लोन ऑफ एनर्जी एंड यू हैव टू रीपे सो यू विल बी रीपेइंग इट इन द सेकंड फेज सो वी विल सी हाउ दैट हैपेंस ओके सो दीस आर द टू फेसेस there are totally 10 reactions in glycolysis each of these phases has five reactions as a part of it preparatory phase is five oxidative or payoff phase is five so we will be first beginning with the preparatory phase so as i said that this term basically means that you are going to modify glucose molecules you are going to bring about some changes in it such that its lysis or cleavage becomes favorable reaction okay so you will be involving reactions like phosphorylation uh, isomerization and then finally breaking in that okay so how are we going to study reactions we are going to study every reaction individually one reaction at a time okay so we will be studying each and every reaction individually okay we will write those reactions we will understand which enzymes are involved in it we will understand what are the cofactors and the coenzymes involved in the process okay and you are going to write it down but do not make a hurry to write it down first i will give you time to write separately okay pay attention to the reaction first do not sit to copy here that can be done from the books also here it is important for you to understand what is taking place in the reaction because if that goes to your mind then you know it's not going to be a very difficult job for you to remember exactly what is this reaction about okay so let us start with the very first reaction which is the phosphorylation reaction so before we start i want all of you to give heading in your book as glycolysis or emp pathway and you are going to give a heading as phosphorylation okay you can give heading first for the phase as well as preparatory pre preparative phase and uh, preparatory phase and give this heading of reaction as phosphorylation once you are done giving the headings first heading is glycolysis or emp pathway under that you are writing phase 1 preparative phase or preparatory phase and under that reaction number 1 phosphorylation once you are done writing this type a yes in the chat box so that i know that you are done doing it okay so now as i said you are not going to write anything till i tell you to do so okay you are just going to pay attention fine so look at what happens in this very first reaction so let us first write the structure of our very famous molecule that is glucose so this is my six carbon compound glucose okay this banda is my sixth carbon okay now in this reaction which we call as phosphorylation the term phosphorylation means addition of phosphate you are going to add phosphate okay you are adding phosphate to the sixth carbon such that the product that you get is glucose 6 phosphate now the donor of this phosphate is adenosine triphosphate that is atp so atp will donate a phosphate and will convert itself to adp so obviously one of the products that i get is going to be adp as atp loses its phosphate and let us see the product
so this is my product wherein you can see the change now see what has happened i have added a phosphate group this is your phosphate group so hydrogen ke jagah par humne phosphate group add kiya hua hai okay and that's how you get the uh, phosphate group attached to the fixed carbon okay so this product that i am showing over here is nothing but glucose six phosphate okay now please remember that the enzyme for any reaction you have a way to remember it you don't have to ratify it for example phosphorylation is addition of phosphate and if you are adding phosphate using atp as the donor okay then your enzyme is going to be kinase so whenever you are adding phosphate and atp is the donor your enzyme is going to be kinase even vice versa if you are forming atp by removing a phosphate and adding it to adp again you will see kinase enzyme playing a role there okay so please understand that kinase over here is going to be the enzyme and the prefix to it is going to be on the basis of our substrate which is a six carbon compound and hence the term hexo kinase okay in liver you have a quite similar enzyme which is the same work it's slightly different in its structure and that's called as glucokinase again kinase because atp is involved as a donor of phosphate and glucose hai isliye gluco so you write either of the enzyme hexokinase or glucokinase you will still get marks but in microorganisms it's always referred to as hexokinase now remember whenever there is kinase there is going to be a cofactor okay this cofactor loves to be associated with phosphate groups which is magnesium ion so mg2 plus is going to be a cofactor whenever you have kinase in the picture because it is it is something that loves to be associated with the phosphate groups and the delta g of the reaction with the free energy of the reaction is minus 4000 calories at ph set because as you change the ph and temperature you will see that the delta g may also change okay so you know that what is free energy change right what does it indicate can someone tell me what does it indicate sir like the amount of energy which can be so what does those values indicate akshay when whenever someone tells you a delta g value for a reaction what do you interpret from that value is so spontaneous or non spontaneous exactly if the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not you know that if the value is going to be negative you know that the reaction is going to be spontaneous right barabar so how do you calculate delta g how do you calculate delta g delta h minus t delta s what is that don't give some jargon based formulas explain what it is explain what are you minusing out and from what um the change in enthalpy from temperature into change in entropy so whatever total change in reaction has taken place total energy change that has taken place you are going to deduct whatever energy is lost to the entropy right that's when you get the free energy change and these values are significant because they tell you whether the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not right now when you say that atp is going to be the donor of phosphate group it's very important for you to understand how it donates the phosphate group. so atp in presence of water is going to split itself to adp and h3po4 
okay this h3po4 is what you are going to add over here so you see po3 and h2 right so uh, that's how you know the phosphate in atp group is first converted to phosphoric acid and that phosphoric acid is responsible for uh, donating the phosphate group to uh, glucose converting it to glucose with phosphate so whenever you see that atp is the donor of phosphate this is how the uh, donation of phosphate group takes place and obviously remember that the delta g for this particular reaction is going to be 7300 calories because you have split the terminal phosphate bond which has this much energy right okay i hope all of you have understood this reaction any query over here anyone okay fine so i will tell you what i am going to do just give me a minute ab chapo bhai लिख के हो जाएगा तो टाइप और डन इन द चैट बॉक्स once you write the reactions please check do not miss out anything don't make any errors see to it that these set of reactions that you note down right now should be your ultimate copy with you so that when you study you have everything in place so once you complete writing just check what you have written magnesium ions are cofactors you should be knowing the role of cofactors you learn this in sy the cofactors are those uh, ions which without which the enzyme doesn't function so uh, magnesium every enzyme has its own set of cofactors magnesium ions is for kinase because magnesium is normally associate themselves with the phosphate groups great i can see that most of you are done uh, obviously we cannot go ahead with the next reaction because we will not finish it but we also had something else to do today which is discuss the test question so i am casting the screen uh, i hope you are able to see the question the very first question says which of the following are part of goals of metabolic study so yes finding the constituents in the stoichiometry 
finding the rate of the reaction, understanding the function of the reaction, and also how that reaction is regulated. So it's going to be all four. Okay, one, two, three, and four. An NMR spectroscopy was performed to analyze the phosphate profile of an individual who has been exercising for 15 minutes. Which of the following components you feel would be depleted? So depleted is going to be creatine phosphate, always. Remember this. Why? Because creatine phosphate is going to be the donor of phosphate to uh, maintain the levels of ATP. Okay, and that's that's the reason why that's going to deplete first. Inorganic phosphate deplete nahi hoga. Inorganic phosphate badega. Kyunki ATP agar hydrolyze ho raha hai, so that inorganic phosphate is going to increase. So depletion of inorganic phosphate will take place after the person has stopped exercising and has rested for at least 5 to 10 minutes. यहाँ पे रेस्टिंग का कुछ मेंशन ही नहीं है यहाँ पे बोला जा रहा है पंद्रह मिनट से वो एक्सरसाइज कर रहा है यानी कि इट इज इन प्रोसेस सो वॉट गोइंग टू गेट एग्जॉस्टेड इज द क्रिएट इन प्रोसेस फ्रॉम द डेटा गिवन बिलो इफ यू विश टू कल्टिवेट स्ट्रेन हैविंग म्यूटेशन इन जीन कोडिंग फॉर एंजाइम वन देन द कल्चर फिल्ट्रेट ऑफ द स्ट्रेन डिफेक्टिव इन एंजाइम डैश कैन बी यूज सो विच ऑफ दिस कैन यू यूज कैन यू यूज द फिल्ट्रेट ऑफ टू थ्री एंड फोर और इज इट नन ऑफ दी अबाउट so you should know that the answer has to be what it has to be none of the above right if it is defective in enzyme 1 you cannot use the filtrates of uh, any other you know strains to cultivate this it has to be none of the above an organism metabolizes compound x in the order of x y z a so that's the process of converting x to a If the organism is grown on W, which it can utilize, but obviously it's not part of the metabolic process of X to A, and then shift it to a media containing Z, what will be the consequence? Obviously, if you have grown it on an unrelated substrate like W, it would have produced all enzymes to metabolize W. It doesn't have any enzymes to metabolize X to A. So now, when you suddenly shift it to a media containing one of the intermediates of X to A pathway, it will go into the lag phase barabar it will go into the lag phase because now it will have to generate all those enzymes which it needs to metabolize x to a okay i don't know how many of you were able to answer it but i saw this that majority of the people have done it some of them have gone wrong so when mutants for 2 3 and 4 are co-cultured 3 and 4 exhibit growth while 2 did not show growth okay so this clearly indicates that uh you know 3 and 4 are exhibiting growth in this process while this the one which is mutant for 2 is not showing you any growth barabar so abhi tumko ye pata chal chuka hai ki jo 2 hai that is somewhere later in the pathway as compared to 3 and 4 okay kyunki 2 ke badolat 3 and 4 grow ho paaye hain तू कुछ तो मेटाबोलाइज करके किधर तो आके अटका है और वो जो अक्यूमुलेट हुआ है इंटरमीडिएट टू के वजह से वो लेकर थ्री एंड फोर ग्रो हुए यानी कि थ्री एंड फोर पाथवे में कहीं पहले है टू बाद में आता है इज दैट वेरी क्लियर तो अभी थ्री एंड फोर में से ऑर्डर पता करने के लिए थ्री और फोर को को कल्टिवेट करना पड़ेगा जिसमें यह पता चला कि फोर ग्रो हुआ लेकिन थ्री नहीं हुआ यानी कि फोर तो थ्री से पहले आ रहा है क्योंकि थ्री जो कुछ भी मेटाबोलाइज करके इंटरमीडिएट अक्यूमुलेट कर रहा है वो यूज करके फोर ग्रो हो रहा है तो फोर इज समेर फर्स्ट इन दाथवे देन कम्स थ्री एंड देन कम्स टू सो फोर थ्री टू इज गोइंग टू बी योर करेक्ट एंसर हैव यू अंडरस्टूड हाउ टू डिड्यूज दिस सो वॉट एवर डज इन ग्रो कम्स लेट इन दाथवे वॉट एवर ग्रोज इज अर्लियर इन दाथवे इफ देर आर टू सच विच आर अर्लियर इन दाथवे को कल्टिवेट दे then see which one grows and which one doesn't grow the one which doesn't grow is later in the pathway the one which grows is first in the pathway so like in this case 2 did not grow so 2 is later in the pathway 3 and 4 are before 2 but 3 and 4 mein order kya hai ye dekhne ke liye jab 3 aur 4 ko co-cultivate kiya to 4 grow hua 3 grow nahi hua yani ki 3 baad mein hai pathway mein 4 usse pehle aata hai so the order becomes 4 3 2 sabko ye samajh mein aaya hai kaise deduce karne ka ये बहुत सिंपल था यू सी कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड ओरिजिनेटिंग फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट एंड फोर्थ कार्बन ऑफ ग्लूकोज द पाथवे हैज टू बी ईडी राइट 
एंटनर डिओड्रॉफ पासून इनहिबिटर्स आर प्रेफर्ड ओव्हर म्युटंट्स फॉर स्टडीइंग मेटाबॉलिझम इज दॅट ट्रू इट्स फॉल्स राईट म्युटंट्स आर प्रेफर्ड मोर बिकॉज इनहिबिटर्स वहां तक पोहोचते नाही पोहोचते बडा कन्फ्युजन होत आहे दॅट इज फॉल्स नाव ह्या पर सेम इमेज है वी हॅव आस दॅट कोण से मेटाबोलाइट हमको प्रोवाइड करणे चाहिए इफ यू नो द ऑर्गॅनिझम इज डिफेक्टिव्ह इन ई ओके सो इफ द ऑर्गॅनिझम इज डिफेक्टिव्ह इन ई वॉट इज दॅट दॅट यू शूड प्रोवाइड फॉर द ऑर्गॅनिझम टू सॉरी नॉट ई द ऑर्गॅनिझम इज म्युटंट इन थ्री एन्झाइम थ्री सो वॉट यू शूड बी प्रोवाइडिंग फॉर इट टू ग्रो so can you tell me which metabolite should you provide in the pathway of a to e kyunki agar 3 mein block hai to c accumulate hoga to tumko media mein kaun se metabolites unko provide karne padenge taki wo grow ho sake the dna 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 right kyunki it doesn't have an enzyme to convert c to d so you will have to give it either d or e so that it can grow effectively so i hope that all questions are clear to you now and uh, i can see that most of you have done pretty well but those who have not been able to do uh, you know as expected please don't get disheartened this these are learning lessons for you okay take it seriously and work towards it so that in the next test you do not face this problem okay so that is it for today we will uh, meet the next time and uh, next week i have already told you that there's going